how do we reduce the suffering by using this process of dependent origination? You learn your body operation well, and you keep on practicing to witness how suffering works. Often, notice the cause of its origination. Notice the cause of its disappearance. Pinpoint where to let go most effectively. Start in by looking at the operation of your own human body. When our eyes are open, the eye sees form. When the ears meet a sound, the ear hears the sound. When the nose hits an odor, the nose smells that odor. When the tongue meets the flavor, the tongue tastes and when the body feels a tangible, body senses touch. And as a being with five external sense doors operating in this way, that's how this works. There is no personal control of their operation. I do not make them operate inside me. They operate when they are in good working order. Internally, mine is a doorway as well to arising thoughts. Mind operates in the same impersonal way as the other sense doors. You can prove it for yourself. So while you're driving home, you do not stop driving and decide to make a thought arise in your mind suddenly about remembering to buy the milk, do you? Bring home the eggs for the dog food or whatever. Don't forget. The thought just comes up and it impersonally arises and passes away. This is the first part of what meditation is about, deeper understanding about how everything works. There is more. Actually, we all take, uh, take all of the sense doors and go step by step into how they operate. By experientially learning about these doors, testing them out, we see that we are not responsible for our, uh, their operation. If the meditator begins to realize that this is actually true. There is an impersonal process going on here. This is what we're trying to help people to understand. In the light of that, when we say, I talk about that, a person has suffering from depression. And depression is something I worked with a great deal for four or five years with the mental health community where I lived. And in depression, the problem is it's not just about the depression, is it? Because when the depression comes first and hits the person, that's a, what, how does that happen? Let's back up. If you're suffering from tension and tightness about something and taking things personal in life, sometimes this tension turns into stress. So when you go to the doctor and disturbed with the stress because you can't sleep or focus properly, sometimes they'll give you a diagnosis, the first one that appears, stress disorder. After the stress disorder gets going, if you not follow the instructions and change your a little bit to ease up on the pressures in life, make more space for yourself and eat right, sleep right, that sort of thing. If, if you don't do that, then the stress disorder will turn into a depressive disorder. Now with this depressive disorder, many different kinds, but I'm talking about the general stress disorder problem flows. You have a, a, a graph, if you drew a line 
zero to 10 grading depressions from zero to five are manageable just fine at home. But you have to understand how they're working, that's the thing. So here, how this is working is when you're at home and you're suffering from a depression, what happens then? The sad part about depression is it's happening in a part of your body that no one, most people in the world don't want to talk about to anyone. If you had a broken arm or broken leg, we, we would say that that's what happened. And you would proceed to make up a story about how you broke your leg or your arm. Sometimes people do that. Or you'd have everybody would, you know, paint the cast and put their name on it and make it a piece of artwork, <laughs> you know? But the thing is, you're not afraid to tell people you have a broken arm or even that you have gas in your body or maybe heart murmur or heart arrhythmia. Most of the things that happen in most parts of your body, you're not ashamed or afraid to talk to people about. And the societal structure is not against you if any of those things happen. But when we start here and we go up, we can talk about the ears, nose, and throat, the ear, nose, throat doctor. We can talk about the eyes, but then the rest of this head, you're not supposed to talk about anything that's inside of it. And you don't want people to know someone in your family has anything going on there. That is what is interesting. Because when Ananda went to the Buddha and he said, Lord, where is the world? And the Buddha answered him and said, Ananda, the world is from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. He was explaining this as the world. So you should be able to talk about anything that is going on in the world within you. That's how this all is structured. But we don't. So depressive disorders were something that also are a little different. When you, when you break your arm, you go sit on the couch and eat a lot of chips and watch the TV while you heal. You know, you take extra time for yourself to heal. But when you have um, something going on mentally, it, your behavior, if your behavior changes, uh, this is disturbing to the other family members. And so the family members suddenly get more involved with what's wrong with you. And they think it's wrong because it's disturbing their lifestyle. This is what's happening. And then they push the person with the depressive disorder, please, go get the medicine, principally not to heal the depression, this is interesting, but to heal life so they're more comfortable around you. This is aggravating, you know, because it's not your illness now, it's the community's illness because they make this whole thing operate that way. And it's understandable if you're, you're disturbing people in the household, they want to calm you down. But what does the person with the depression really want? They want to be able to live independently. And they want to be able um, to choose what they want to do in life, live the way they want, just like anyone else. That's a, the problem. It comes take, taken out of their hand. Now, Buddhism looks at this whole thing, says the first thing you need to understand uh, is when this depression happens, the person also suffers not just from depression. First, they suffer from feeling anxiety because they're disturbed. Symptoms like agoraphobic and go in their house and not come out to deal with anybody because they feel like they can't deal with anybody. Then I'll just stay in my house and stay away from people. They withdraw. It's very sad. It's very sad. And um, so there are all these sub-diagnoses. Then if someone comes and says, but may I want you to come out and come to lunch with me, and you're deciding you want to stay inside, then may might have a panic attack. 
inside or try to go to lunch with me and have a panic attack in the restaurant. And this is all very embarrassing and not can't be stopped because it's a natural flow of things. And all of this is happening because the person believes this is all my fault. And when you think the depression is yours and it's all your fault, that's very difficult to overcome to heal. So the first thing we need to do is go back and look at how depression actually works. And this issue of how depression works, we use dependent origination to examine that, which we will go into in another lesson that talks more about that depression and how step-by-step -step these things happen and how you can actually, if you understand how to observe the deep, dependent origination, you begin to see that it is a uh, individual process. It is an impersonal process going on. Because it is an impersonal process going on, it's not your fault. Aha! So now you can't go around saying, it's all my fault. I'm to blame. I'm not useful, I'm no good, and all these other things that have come up in your mind, all the panic attacks, withdrawal, agoraphobia, everything, are additional diagnoses that come on top of mental, the mental dis diagnosis in the beginning because of a lack of understanding and acceptance in the social structure and in the family even, it, it makes things far more difficult than it has to be, see? And depend, dependent origination can show you how the emotional structure that is troublesome in uh, disturbing emotions that happen, how did they arise and how did they operate? Where is the weakest point and how can I counter them? And can I help myself to manage this? negative side that's coming up by going over to the positive side and replacing it, you see? But before you learn that, to really get it deeply, this assignment will help you, okay? And this assignment that comes on this lesson is, please, you, I think you can still go here. I didn't check me, but I think you can still go to donaldsigpa.org. Listen to the instructions for the med meta meditation that's on that on the site, it'll help you. Uh, it's definitely there. It'll help you if everyone does the same meditation during the training, then the instructions for practicing metta and the, the walking with metta instructions are found in the instructions for metta meditation and the six R's by Bhante Moramsi. Find these things on the Dhammasupa website. Take a look at them, and then the next step in the assignment, while you're learning this meditation, don't sit any less than 30 or 40 minutes. You guys all know this, you're long sitters. Um, but when you're sharing with somebody, they should really not try to learn this with 10 or 15 minutes sits that are useless. We know very well now, 30 minutes is the minimum to touch the deep uh, one level than living outside and sometimes there's a 30 minute person up that has to be a 40 minute person but no less than that over the training information at the website we're going to have some good training information pretty soon on the asian website too as we get more involved in that and then there's an exercise in here and this is pretty easy treat yourself by taking a little walk outside don't just talk about the aggregates and how the person is set up, but watch more closely as you walk. Take a walk and notice your sense doors. How are they operating? Become aware of changing tension as you begin to hear or smell or taste or touch. Notice how thoughts just come up on their own. And don't be serious as you are doing this assignment. Play with this slightly. Have fun. Play games. Enjoy this observation time. 
smile as much as you can through everything you do today. Lightening up is extremely important for the meditation to work well. Now, I know this may be different if you were practicing any other way before, but please try this exactly as the instructions ask you to, to find out what it is. And you'll be able to see, uh, to sense how the tension in the body begins to arise when any distraction happens in life. Notice that too. And this is how we purify and retrain our mind. Mind is the forerunner of all things. And body also should remember, body always follows mind. So when somebody says, but can't I work with my body while I'm learning TWIM? First, I want you to learn TWIM. I want you to learn the actual way of letting go that is the most effective way that works. Then I want you to use metta, karuna, mudita, upeka. Because why? Because it also helps you to let go um, as a result of practicing metta, let go of ill will thoughts, practicing compassion, let go of thoughts of cruelty, practicing meditation or practicing life um, with joy in your life. Uh, it, 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 this, this is um, the joy helps you to not be discontent. If you have joy inside you, internally, you get to that level where you're keeping it. Let me tell you, these women, there's no way they could be discontent. <laughs> they're so smiling, just so smiling all day with everything they're doing. They have yogi chores in this retreat too. And everything they're doing, I can walk around see everybody's smiling. The thing is, in this program, they've been working on for seven or eight years before a final ordination. Every program they've been working with has said, we're teaching you this, read the instructions. And I'm shocked when someone walks in here and they say, I read the instructions all the way from the beginning to the end. And then I did it and it worked exactly like you said. And I'm there, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of times people don't read the whole instructions. And this, this uh, practice has little things we tell you that are going to help you uh, to work with it very easily and learn all of it. So always read the instructions before you try to learn part of it. As you play with this, you enjoy the observation time, smile as much as you can. Uh, then you'll be able to sense the tension in your body as it begins to arise when any distraction happens to come up. Notice that too. This is how we purify and retrain mind. Mind is the forerunner of all states, and that's why we say the body always follows. You don't need to relax your whole body in a separate body scan. You only need to tell your brain now we relax, we let go of something and then we relax the head. And then the body will filter through and start to relax. Mind relaxes the body, just keep on thinking, never mind. And as you, as you let go and then keep on relaxing, smiling and coming back or returning, you'll be purifying your mind each time to gradually change your life as you go all the way through to the liberation of mind and Nibbana, experience Nibbana, okay? So Nibbana is the opening, I'm gonna come out of here. Nibbana, essentially Nibbana is the opening that occurs. It's a real fun thing to go to the library and find stuff about Nibbana today. I mean, there's such obscure stories that have been written about Nibbana today. Nobody wants to go back in the text and figure out what was going on. I can show you suttas now that I found for in the bottom part of the sutta. It, the statement comes up and then the monk experienced Nibbana for the first time. What does that imply? 
is not only one time. <laughs> and yet we have other people writing theses and saying such things as we're going to take you to Nibbana. Now take you to Nibbana should mean give you enough training that you can get the conditions right so that you can experience what happens with the opening of mind as, a, as Nibbana occurs. That's what it really means. But if I say I'm going to train you so that you can get to Nibbana and then the guy writes a story and says, we're going to Nibbana, mom. We're not going to be here next week when my brother gets back. We're, we're going to Nibbana this weekend. We're going to go to a retreat and go to Nibbana. And there are actually books out there. You frown at me ever. You got to go to a big bookstore and fish around. And when you start looking in those books, you'll find things like Sotapanna can't take happen for 10,000 years or a thousand years. It can't happen to anybody. And you'll find things like uh, Nibbana. There was, uh, and when I did the research, there was like about seven or eight different explanations for Nibbana. Here's one for you, if you doubt me. There is a man who had a, uh, actually a monastic, who had a master's degree in, uh, and he taught English at a university in the United States. And he wrote a thesis at master's level and turned it into a book and sold it. And he says that Gautama Buddha, Buddha is the last name. And if Gautama had a son, he would become the next Buddha because it's a line of descent, like a line of kings, like the Windsor house in England and the bloodline goes down so that that's how, so the bloodline must have, burnt, you know, died out because there, if there isn't a Buddha now, you see, because that didn't follow up very well. <laughs> but it's these things, when you watch, you look at them, they're very far away. And I think this is just me and my opinion. I'm getting pretty precocious with this, but I'll tell you right now, okay, when you get to a place in the history of Buddhism where the whatever practice you're doing isn't taking you to the path and it's not an easy, simple to understand, easy to understand, immediately effective anymore, okay, and it doesn't particularly invite deeper inspection, it it's, turns out to be something people are going three, four times a year to retreat and go home. But they, it's just inviting the deeper inspection meant so you stop going around town doing other things and you really want to know, where does this go? If I keep practicing this, the, the expression in the United States is, how deep does the rabbit hole go? <laughs> it's from Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> when you dive in that rabbit hole that she dived into, Exactly how deep does that rabbit hole go? Of course, it took her to Wonderland. But the whole point of it is, why are we doing that? It's, uh, it's like if you have a call, and go out and you put a different oil in it or a different transmission fluid or a different gas in it today, the car doesn't perform the way it said it was going to and you get all upset. So you make up stories about, well, that Ford car or that Buick or whatever car it is, it's no good. The car's no good. Well, it isn't the car. You didn't read the handbook for the car and so you're not using the proper equipment with the car and then the car doesn't do what they said the car was going to do and you want to go back to the to the to the factory and and figure out what should i do get another car well sure you can get another car if you want to but the thing is are you going to treat it any better now here's the thing the main instructions for this whole thing we talk about meditation are in the suttas. But if we keep going to everywhere except the suttas directly, we will never figure out how it actually worked. And then if I, why would we just, well, the solution they say is write another book and say that this is the end result or write another book and make up a different story. But nobody wants, uh, it's not nobody, I want to go back and find out what 
did said her to go to my phone. And when you fit, do you know that he really did find an escape from suffering? Not just one nibbana, one time and bang and everything fixed. But did you find out that he had it, a remarkable, incredibly perfected systematic system that works step by step? And in this case, in this retreat, nobody's had meditation before. And that's part of the beauty of this retreat with this women. They have not read about meditation in their life or got involved in it except doing deep prayer, which is no concentration at all, just relaxing and sitting and allowing yourself to drop, 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 which could take in their estimation nine to 10 years to get to the level that these women have gotten to in less than one week. And that's why they're so excited. They're excited that they can get into the descriptions of deep, deep personal prayer in one week. I'm excited because all 15 of them working independently actually read the instructions and try it and follow it and then things work systematically, just the way we tell you they're going to work. And it works. But they don't just do this meditation in the Dhamma Hall either. They take it down and you can walk around the monastery. They're using it in the kitchen. They're using it when they mop the floors. They're using it when they're teaching a class. They're using it when they're trying to settle, a, you know, which way we should do something. It's wonderful. And I just, you know, you keep teaching. We have to take the attitude. We can, all we can do is teach it and present it. If you don't want to read the instructions and you don't, before you try part of it, if you don't want to read all the instructions, and if you don't want to follow the steps precisely, then if you want to say it doesn't work, it's okay. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> you see? But those initial, I think, Bhante, seriously, in the, in the puja ceremony, every time you go to the puja ceremony, anywhere, you know that you hear Sanditiko, Akaliko, A.E. Pasiko, Opanaiko, Pachitam, Wei Tabo, Winuiti. And you know what it means. Easy to understand, immediately effective, inviting deeper inspection. And it was something that was going to be untouched by time. So that's what Bhante Vimala Ramsey went to try and figure out what was that? Because the one thing in all of the traditions, that statement is there. It's fascinating. Vajrayana Mahayana Tarvada. They don't like, it's not they don't like each other, but they don't agree. But by golly gosh, gee whiz, that statement is right there inside their each one's ceremony. But then when you start to practice, sometimes it doesn't look like that's right, does it? <laughs> So what do you think about this? It's out on the floor. That's what I get. Yeah.